sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Rachel. I'm Congressman Drunkman's Chief of Staff. Just wanted to welcome you all here. We're very happy to be in Cedarburg. Want to run through how we're going to run the town hall today. Congressman Grothman is going to start out with a short speech, giving you an update on what's going on in, in D.C., and then also kind of what he's been working on around the district. After that, I believe most of you have filled out questions and put them in a bucket. If you have not, let us know and we'll get you a piece of paper for you to write that question on. That question, as I said, went in a bucket. I will randomly select them and I will come to you. You can read your question to the congressman and then he will answer. Just a reminder, Please don't talk over other people in the audience. We want to make sure that he can hear your question and others can hear your question and the answer. So if we can all just be nice to everyone and make sure that we don't talk over anyone else. And here's Congressman Grossman for you. Well, thank you for being here today. It's great to have this hall in Cedarburg. I grew up in Thienesville, just down the road, so I feel like I'm just at home. Makes fun of you know. We've done these all over the district, but it makes this especially enjoyable. I feel like I'm at home right now. You're aware for the 6th Congressional District, there's a little bit of an unusual map here. Cedarburg and Mequon, this area is kind of in the southeastern tip. The district goes all the way up Lake Michigan, north of Two Rivers. It goes across the middle of the state, all the way to Wisconsin Dells. The biggest cities are, can you hear me all, by the way? Oshkosh. Um, Oshkosh, Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, Mantawak, and Nina, which is kind of where the population base is. Um, I'm beginning my second term right now. Tell you a little bit about what's going on in Washington before we open it up for questions. I am on three committees, uh, Education and Workforce, Government Oversight, and the Budget Committee. I'll talk about those in a second. We have been more productive than I think most people know. Uh, Donald Trump did have compared to his peer group. A very high number of bills signed at the beginning of his presidency. Um, we also passed through resolutions that we are allowed to do to undo regulatory changes that Barack Obama made near the end of his presidency. Uh, the ability to do that with only 51 votes in the Senate. And I will later explain that one of the reasons we haven't gotten more done is because the role connected with 51 votes in the Senate. We were able to undo regulatory bills with 51 votes. We've done that 15 times in history. That was only done once before this year. So we have been doing things. Um, in the Education Committee, we got a bill out to provide more flexibility for local districts to work with business towards skills-based education. I think we're all aware right now that businesses in this district are screaming for more employees. We also have a lot of college graduates out there maybe general degrees in which they have huge debts and quite frankly a lot of times they might have going back to tech schools or going back to trade schools later on to get a job where they can earn a good family supporting income. We are doing what we can to make sure those kids don't make that mistake and get a skills based education in the first place. That bill has come out of the house. We've also had a variety of bills signed into law. One, improving the way we deal with the Veterans Administration. We all know there have been problems with the Veterans Administration. Until now, it was almost impossible to get rid of the bad employees in the Veterans Administration. I think in part because of Donald Trump's leadership, we have been able to reform the VA, which is the bill that went through both the House and the Senate. That was a good thing. We've also passed a variety of bills on human trafficking that are going through the Senate. That is a bigger problem in our country now than it's been in the past. Finally, we have taken up bills in the House dealing with regulatory general regulatory reform. As you may be aware, a lot of the burdens or complaints I get about government are not even things that Congress voted directly on. What happens is that Congress over the years has given authority to the Department of Labor, the Environmental Protection Agency, what have you, and they can come up with bills that cost business or farming, whatever, hundreds of thousands, of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. So in the future, those regulatory changes will have to go through. Congress if the Senate takes up the bill. Um, otherwise, as far as the high profile things that you might be disappointed if not passed, I think I'm going to anticipate we're going to get some sort of question on health care. Um, something is going to have to be done on health care. Over time, more and more counties around the state only have one insurance company involved with Obamacare. 
obviously it's always a bad thing when you have a monopoly anywhere. The cost is going to continue to spiral out of control. I hope Congressman, Congress deals with this problem before it gets much worse. It's going to have to take some compromising, as you're perhaps aware. I voted on two bills connected with Obamacare, um, one in committee and one on the floor. The bill, a placeholder sort of bill, they tried to pass out of the Senate, failed. I happened to be hanging around there that night. They were one vote short of what they needed. I know Vice President Pence was trying to talk to John McCain into voting for a placeholder bill at the end. He apparently failed. I'm a little bit disappointed in Senate, uh, Senate leadership in that they did not try to work hard to get John McCain's vote. John McCain did not say he would be opposed to any bill. What he said is he wanted committee hearings and he wanted uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office estimates. I do not know why Mitch McConnell, if he really wants to wrap this thing up, does not then say, okay, John McCain will spend August or September getting these estimates, holding hearings, then we'll take another vote, presumably you can vote to keep the ball rolling. I also wish that the House was more aggressive in working with the Senate on this on this provision. Right now, the attitude of the House is kind of, we'll let the Senate go, we went. I think one of the problems in Washington is sometimes the Senate and House do not work in concert. As you know, I used to represent Cedarburg in the state legislature. I always felt in the state legislature there was more communication between the Senate and the House than there is in Washington. Hopefully, when I get back, I'll try to encourage more of that, and hopefully we can solve the health care crisis before it gets any worse. Um, also, with regard to the education, I said I'm on the education committee. We are going to try to do something with regard to student loan debt. It is a huge problem. I assume many of you out there, maybe yourselves, or maybe no relatives or friends, or maybe in their 30s or 40s and have huge student loan debt. The question is, what can we do to prevent this from going out of control in the future? Um, we are working on a bill on the Education Committee. I have two amendments that I would like to have attached. One of them I think I have a good chance at, and that is requiring the educational institutions to sign off before a student takes out the student loans. When I talk to educational institutions, they tell me sometimes kids, and I'll believe this because it happened when I was younger, took out student loans for more than they had to. The reason they do that is if they get more money, it can kind of help them with lifestyle and have a little more enjoyable life when they're 19 or 20 years old. It's, enjoy you know, it's fun to have a more enjoyable life when you're 19 or 20, but sometimes the student loans you took out to get that life are not that fun to pay out when you're 35 or 40. So I'd like to require the colleges to get more involved before more student loans are issued. It's something I don't think will I will succeed at, but I want to get the idea out there. I don't think it's a bad thing if colleges have to, have to in essence, co-sign for maybe 5 or 10% of the student loans. I think it would be a good idea because they would be more incentivized to make sure that their students get jobs, make sure they get internships, make sure they're directed in majors in which they can't get jobs if they have some skin in the game. So that's kind of what's going on there. I'm also on the budget committee. Um, this year, the federal deficit will exceed $20 trillion. Uh, obviously, that is not a good thing. It's over $60,000 per person. And that's not the actuarial estimate. That's real debt. If you have a family of four, you're $240,000 trillion, $240, of debt. That's obviously unacceptable and even scary. I have done what I can to prevent Congress from spending much more on this budget. And I think I've had victories, but they aren't the, as big of victories as I want. Um, Congress does not normally vote on 70% of the funding and the, uh, the spending in the federal budget. We do not deal with what they call mandatory spending, which is most things that you're entitled to by filling out a government form. It could be things that you've worked your whole life for and are entitled for, like Social Security and Medicare. It could be, say, welfare-related programs. On the 30% that we do vote for, Donald Trump uh, asked for a 5.5% increase in military spending. If you talk to people in the military, or have relatives in the military, I think they will tell you scary stories to the degree to which the military has been neglected recently. Um, so I support President Trump's 5.5% increase. 
A lot of members of Congress want to go over 11%. I think that's irresponsible. I think to give an agency that much more money in the short term, I'm not sure they know what to do with it. Right now, we are holding that increase to 9.5%. I don't think it has to be that high. Maybe it's like preventing from getting it still higher. Uh, Non-military spending, Donald Trump expected a cut of 7 or 8%. That cut is now only about 1.2%. I think it could have gone higher. I'm disappointed in my leadership team and that they did not force the Appropriation Committee to go for a greater than 1.2% cut there. Um, the rest of the spending for the first time in, I don't know, 15 years, we are going to be looking at mandatory spending. Uh, right now, the bill before Congress contains about a, uh, contains a $200 billion cut over 10 years. That sounds like a lot, it really isn't. That's about $20 billion a year that can back it towards the out years. In the past, Congress has passed budgets saying we're going to balance things in 10 years based on a promise of being responsible in the out years. I don't trust Congress to get it right. Nevertheless, this is a step in the right direction. I will push strong when I get back to Congress that $200 billion be raised to $400 billion or $300 billion. So at least you make, a, make more of a dent in things. That's a little bit of what's going on in Congress right now. Um, we have passed a lot of things on a bipartisan basis, but on the big ticket issues, not as much progress as I like. You know I talk about welfare reform frequently. I've gotten mixed messages from Paul Ryan as to when we'll take that up. He had been telling me a couple months ago, I would be calling him for about six months, that he might take it up this year, but I haven't heard about it a lot for the last five or six weeks, which concerns me. Um, welfare reform, like tax reform, has got to go through what they call a reconciliation process. I know a lot of you are disappointed we haven't done it yet. For most things in the Senate, it requires 60, no, 60 votes, which means it has to be bipartisan. That is true of any appropriation bill. So whenever there's a big spending bill that comes out of Congress and you wonder why things can't be more bipartisan, all major spending bills are bipartisan. By, by law, they have to. That is sometimes frustrating and Chuck Schumer has to sign off on these bills, but uh, that is what happens. An exception is through something called reconciliation. We can pass some Senate bills with 51 votes. That is true of the Obamacare repeal bill that almost passed. We did that with reconciliation in last year's budget. In this year's budget, I hope we do something with welfare reform. We will do something with tax reform. There are right now two tax reform proposals that are out there. They are not that detailed. One of the proposals is put together by the House, um, by the House Ways and Means Committee. The other is a rough draft put together by Donald Trump. I have concerns of both of them, but I don't think we're doing enough to look out for the middle class. Um, and Donald Trump, after his own proposal was out there, kind of echoed what I had been saying, which made me feel good, because he's going to have to sign up on whatever we do. I do not think the tax bill should be overly weighted towards people living off investment income. I don't think they should be treated much better than people who are working for, for a living. And, uh, and the initial proposal that the House put out there, and I've been very vocal we can't do this, they had a significantly low tax rate on investment income as opposed to income that you're earning if you're a nurse or a welder or a truck driver. So I'm making progress there, and I'm glad Donald Trump is weighing in against the House Republican plan as well. That's a little bit what's going on. Uh, we have a good rule. I think, as I said before, I used to be in this room all the time when Jim Sensenbrenner used to have me into this room, and I don't think he's ever had so many people here. So it makes me feel good that we have an involved citizenry. I'll take it as a compliment that so many people uh, are here to listen to me. Rachel has a bucket with a variety of questions in. We're going to see how many questions we get through in the next 45 minutes. So off we go. Well, Adams. It's nice to be here. So my question is uh, about funding for uh, disaster relief for Hurricane Harvey. I know that this is going to be their estimates that this could be like a $40 billion damage estimate from this storm. Um, but, so that would make it the biggest since Sandy, uh, which was about $70 million. The budget for FEMA is like $14 billion, right? So we're not going to be able to cover the cost out of the regular FEMA budget. Um, my question for you is, are you going to support supplemental emergency spending bills 
to cover the Well, it depends on the size of the bill and depends on the bill. You know, in the past, uh, on Sandy, they had a very generous bill. I think after the fact, it became apparent they were wasting a lot of money. Uh, already, leadership is asking us to vote for an appropriations bill that is just way too, way too big spending. And I hope, just like in your family, if something comes up, we have emergency spending somewhere, they spend a little less somewhere else. I haven't seen the individual bill. I don't understand what I'm going to vote for against the bill until I see the details. But I am mindful of, of the fact that in the past, they sometimes wasted money. And mindful of that, if you're going to have a big new bill out there, but you have to Rick Schultz, do you need your card? Or do you remember your questions? Uh, I think I do. I can bring it over. <laughs> can you hear me all, by the way? Am I talking loud enough? No. no. Not really. Oh, 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 I'll try to scream. I'll try to scream more. Okay, we've done this twice this morning, and once I had a microphone, and once I didn't, the last time they were satisfied, but I'll try to speak up more. Okay, go ahead. All right, so you, you spoke a little bit to this, but I, I heard you use the words, I wish and I hope, and, you know, hope isn't really a very good operational strategy, so I'm curious as to what you're really going to do when you go back to get this Obamacare monstrosity pulled. Well, as you know, because I, I don't, I want to follow up on your tax question because I think everyone knows, or I think it's actually in the facts, that if we don't get Obamacare pulled, we don't have the money to do much. We can't get beyond this, this no impact tax plan. So I, I don't see how you got a Chinese chance in hell of doing anything with taxes. I really don't. Um, there, it, I will encourage the House to engage with the Senate. As I said, one of the frustrating things in Washington compared to Madison is the Senate and House do not act in concert. And the degree to which the House is saying it's now the Senate's problem to pass something is frustrating. I voted for two bills in the House, which shows I'm able to compromise. And I anticipated another proposal coming back from the Senate. I will encourage House leadership to work with the Senate and not give up at this time. Um, eventually, something is going to have to be done because we have a huge number of counties in the country in which there is only one provider under Obamacare. Obviously, you have one provider in a monopoly. The cost is going to continue to go up and make Obamacare a complete failure. Um, there are also eventually probably going to be counties without any private sector insurer playing at all. So I think ultimately something will have to pass, although the more it goes on and the more pressure Congress feels, the more likely whatever they pass won't be, won't be very good. But, you know, I'm one of 435. I am very outspoken when I'm there. And I will try to weigh in and encourage the House to prod the Senate and work with the Senate so they get their 50 points. Do you think we need a change in leadership with Ryan? Well, it's being delayed in the Senate. Uh, Paul's doing a, a, a good job. I like Paul. It's being delayed in the Senate. Quite frankly, I don't think there's a sense of urgency on the part of a cop. I happened to be in the Senate chambers the night that that vote went down. Um, and they lost by one. I know Mike Pence was over there trying to talk to John McCain until the last week. John McCain, public reason for voting no, which like I said, we have no committee hearings on this bill. We need a Congressional Budget Office estimate. The bill was really a placeholder bill, so I'm willing to make an exception for that. But that's what John McCain said. If I were Mitch McConnell and I wanted to get it done, I'd say, okay, John McCain, you've explained why you voted no in July. You want some committee hearings. You want a Congressional Budget Office estimate. Fine, we'll give you that. We're going to take another vote in September. And the fact that Mitch McConnell didn't say that makes me wonder where his heart is. You know, he gave a nice speech about how he worked so hard and how so many people wanted this to pass. Now he wanted it to pass, but now we have to move on. Uh, the Senate can work on more than one thing at once. They can work. They can have you know 15 people working on tax reform here and 10 people working on Obamacare repeal there. And I, I think we just have to put more pressure on Mitch McConnell 
and the, assembly, uh, the House has to volunteer to put people uh, with the Senate to help them get to 50 votes, I guess is my opinion, and I'll try to do that when I get back. You can say, hope, oh, like I said, I want 435 in one House. Um, I know President Trump has expressed his opinion that he still wants to get going, so somehow we got to get the Senate a little bit more engaged. Barb Grossmeyer. I wrote this fast, so um, I have some other things too. <coughs> Basically, what I wanted to say was like, most people in this room are very politically aware. You know, uh -huh. so excluding this room, I think the population is not paying that much attention. So it is the big items because the word out there is they're not doing anything the Republican Party is not doing anything. Um, especially with the health care that, you know, like remember when Scott Walker got in and it was boom, 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 boom. And that's what you guys have to do. And I don't blame you. I blame I think Mitch McConnell doesn't have the urgency. Right? He's, we have to get those big things done so the general population knows you guys are doing something. We I will agree with you, and I have made that speech to my Republican colleagues and Paul Ryan frequently. I do frequently compare what's going on in Washington to what happened in Wisconsin when Scott Walker took office. Um, we have been waiting a long time to make it run and balancing the budget. We waited a long time for welfare reform, we waited a long time for tax reform, and we waited a long time to do something with Obamacare. And these other bills, well, in volume, are historically high, and you can say we've been much more productive than the Republicans were in the first two years of Bush, or the Republicans were in the first two years of Bush, too, or or were more productive than Bill Clinton was in his first two years. That is not why we were elected. We were elected to get things done on taxes and welfare and Obamacare and the budget. Right. And I make that pitch to them loudly without making myself rude. Yeah, I believe you because you guys are all elected because of Trump. Like them or not, his agenda is what you want to do. Do they realize that? They're committing political suicide if they don't do Trump's agenda. Well, I, I'm not sure they got elected because of Trump, because most congressmen, I think, did better in their districts than Trump. But I think the fact that Trump got elected, despite his tweets, um, shows that people really want to change and are really dissatisfied with the way things were. And I. I certainly understand that myself. And I tell it to my colleagues, and I, I will say this. I think there are too many congressmen who do not have a sense of urgency. And to me, our country has huge problems right now. And there's some congressmen who think it's like 1978, and we have 30 years to right the ship. We don't have 30 years to right the ship. This is a golden opportunity. 2017 should be the year that you waited in Congress 40 years to live. Yes. And too many, not exclusively, but too many of the people who've been around there a while are just viewing this as any other year. And it should be another year. Right. So it is heartbreaking, heartbreaking to me to see the Republicans who are running the show and they're not doing anything about it. And like you said, lack of urgency. It just breaks my heart. I, I will give you a story, just so you know what we have. And I don't know why this wasn't more publicized nationwide, but it's indicative of the problems. Before I left, in one of these newspapers that people only read in Washington, roll call or political or one of these things, um, one of my colleagues in an important position, Charlie Dent, announced that leadership had better not spend any less money than the current budget that was out there. And he said that leadership, I'm sure he meant Paul Ryan, had said things to him in private in the past when he asked him for votes or help on things. And of course, a lot of people talk different privately than publicly. And he kind of threatened to go public with those conversations if we try to cut any more than what we have right now. Now, on a personal level, I think that is so appalling.
to go to the press and, in essence, try to blackmail leadership, which is what it did. And secondly, it shows that in this massive budget where we're going to be borrowing 13 or 14 percent of the amount we spend, we have a person who's been given an important role on the, I mean, you know, you don't want to subcommittee challenge you about appropriations is, but take my word for it, it's an important deal. Uh, publicly threatening Paul Ryan if, if he spends ten dollars less than where we are right now, which is too high. Um, he would be an example of somebody who's been around there quite a while, who uh, apparently thinks that we're not spending enough money. And, and we have too many of those people in Washington and I have to deal with them. Marissa Levin. Um, my question is about infrastructure. Um, you know, they're talking about, um, and I certainly sympathize and empathize with the talk about, we're wasting time talking about the use of bathrooms for transgender people. And um, Mr. Trump's comment about one, one minute it's okay for the transgender to be in the, in the services, another minute they cannot. My question is about infrastructure. Instead of arguing about that, why not, like they did in the 30s, have the CCC put people to work and let them work on fixing our in infrastructure? Perhaps the flooding in Houston would not have been as horrific as it is. I have cousins that live in Houston, and they had just had the drainage in their block fixed, so they're not being flooded out, but there are other parts of Houston where it is so catastrophic. Why can't, and it would be a great way to, for jobs, because Mr. Trump talks about jobs, this, jobs, that, and if you put people to work to build up our infrastructure, because bridges are falling apart, there are problems with the railroad tracks, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera, why not work on infrastructure? <coughs> okay, as to your first comment, um, I, I never heard of I don't know, they knew what the word transgender was until Barack Obama came president. So that's not a Donald Trump thing. Uh, excuse me. Secondly, due, with that, due I, respect, I, I didn't yeah. say it was anybody's problem. Uh, yes, this is something that has been around for a long time. Um, on infrastructure, as you know, Donald Trump ran a platform of a sizable infrastructure expansion. Um, I have not heard about it as much lately, and I don't know why that is. We are already borrowing 13 or 14 percent of our budget. I can tell you, in compared to the budget that Donald Trump introduced, we are spending 80 or 90 billion dollars more than we want. Substantially more on military, which does employ people. I mean, more procurement, more people working in, in the military factories raises for the military personnel, and we are not cutting as much as Donald Trump wanted in non-military. Presumably that's going to be more people working for the government and more people with jobs there. Um, as far as doing, I think we will do something with infrastructure, but I am assuming because so many people got to the gate first to spend more on other things, there won't be anywhere near as huge of an infrastructure bill as Donald Trump initially proposed. And you've got to remember, we are broke out of our mind. Uh, and when it comes to, quite frankly, the jobs that people work on in infrastructure, there are places around the country where we have a hard time finding people to fill those jobs. <coughs> right. We have a hard time finding people, find people to fill those jobs, even though some of those jobs are paying eighty or hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, what about what about the people that are in welfare? How about can can not are they unemployable to um, work on infrastructure? I because that believe, would be solve that would solve yeah, one problem. I, I I believe with regard to welfare right now, our benefits are generous enough that some people are electing not to work as hard as they should. They may work a little bit because right now the programs, I think you max out if you're making kind of in that ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. And uh, I think we should do something with those programs, encouraging more people to work. Because the jobs are there. And if you look at our unemployment rate, it's pretty historically low right now. And there are places in the United States, the Boygan area, where it just 
everywhere you go, there's signs asking people to work. Um, I mean, the problem isn't that we have to, you know, pay people ten dollars an hour to do whatever in Houston. I mean, a lot of here in Wisconsin jobs are available. Either people aren't working, or they have been not been trained to do the jobs that are available. Well, why can't there be money? Used to train these people. I'm sure that they are tra trainable. Education is so important. I'm a retired educator. I taught in Grafton for 34 years, the primary grades. And it distresses me to no end that Betsy Ross, the secretary, Betsy DeVos, is the Secretary of Education. And listening to what you had said earlier about student loans and everything on the collegiate level, a lot of things are not happening in our schools from kindergarten to high school. We need to work with those children there. Okay. Um, well, I, I know the local school boards are trying hard to do a good job on the local level and maybe something <laughs> a lot of times they are, sometimes they are. We have technical schools in the state, we have trade schools in the state. I had a job fair in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin last week, and people are begging for people to work. Okay, if people want to work in construction, you know, the operating engineers, the pipe fitters, I mean, they're all looking for people. To, those are just the union guys, and there are plenty of non-union opportunities as well. But I know the union guys are looking very desperately for people to get involved in this area. Now, part of the problem, at least part of the problem, is that I think a lot of people have been educated in the schools that you should go to a four-year university. And that's a mistake because you can find people making six figures working construction right now. Oh, sure. And they, they have been told that's not an option. But if you are a young people looking for a person looking for a career and you're not afraid to use your hands, man, the jobs are there. Well, college isn't for everybody. Well, and we need to, the, the schools well, we, need we, to okay. promote yeah, technical yeah. education as well. Right, yeah, they have failed in that regard, yes. Sarah Allen? Oh, right here. So my question is on health care. Um, I'm 28. Um, 2015, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a chronic um, autoimmune disease. So um, I have experienced total paralysis in my arms. I wasn't able to walk. I had problems with my vision. Um, so my question is regarding your plan for pre-existing conditions. Pretty much since the nice um, celebration in the Rose Garden, I have not had any sort of comfort that I will be able to keep my life. If I don't have health insurance, I can't be a mom. I can't be a citizen. I can't work. So I guess, what is your, do you have like a small <coughs> plan to make sure we are taken care of? Well, first of all, um, I voted for something called the 21st Century Cures Act. And in the current budget, and this is not a short-term answer, but a long-term answer, one of the places that Congress, regardless of what bill comes out, will increase spending is more research for diseases like multiple sclerosis. So hopefully we'll make progress there. And like I said, despite the huge debt we have, there, there is going to be an increase in spending in trying to cure diseases. But you can understand my worry when you say, right. oh, I hope there's a cure, not someday. Right. Um, as far as pre-existing conditions are concerned, or people with low income, one of, one of several things is going to happen. Um, I voted for a bill that um, would have required uh, some coverage of pre-existing conditions. You also have badger care in this state, which covers a lot of people who have low income. I believe when we pass a bill, the federal government will put seed money in there for something kind of like what Wisconsin used to have. And that was a hearse in which we tried to cover people with extremely expensive pre-existing conditions. And I think between the three things, we will find a way to cover pre-existing conditions. Yes. Is there a David P? Yeah, David Pelican? No. All right. Uh, sure. I think this is you. No. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's bad news. <laughs> All right, so um, I just want to talk about HR 3362, which is the appropriations bill for state and foreign operations. Um, this is a bill that was introduced on July 24th by Hal Rogers out of the Appropriations Committee. Um, it would cut that appropriations by over $10 billion. Um, I think a lot of people will recognize that the State Department and our foreign operations need reform. But what this does is it cuts hundreds of, million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars from uh, the World Bank, it cuts um, embassy security for um, overseas commitments. And I was just wondering, would you be an advocate of sort of not having those cuts? And I know this bill is going to get probably repackaged um, as we go down the road. But would you be in favor of eliminating some of these cuts to important things that you know promote economic freedom um, around the world? Well, right now that bill, the spending on, uh, you're right, we packed with other bills. As I mentioned, I think, and this is one reason why I'm fighting for it, I think collectively the package before Congress will, with discretionary spending, even if I take $20 billion for perhaps cutting mandatory spending, is going to be one of the more sizable increases we've had in the last seven years, which is not something that I felt I was running to do. Okay, we're already 13 or 14, uh, borrowing 13 or 14 percent of my budget, and there are plenty of people in Congress who are going to run around and try to spend more money. That's going to not be my niche. Linda Lates? Some medical professionals are making decisions 
with one eye on the bottom line. And if everybody was spending what we are in Wisconsin on Medicare and the other states were, that would be a big step in the right direction. Um, that's my... So nothing for three years, basically. Well, nothing's been done for a long time. And Donald Trump is going after, like I said, he's more aggressive on military than Congress directly. He's been very aggressive on, uh, on non-military discretionary. And I think ultimately there'll be discretionary on means table, means tested welfare stuff. All of which I think you could say that Barack, Barack Obama or George Bush did almost nothing. So he, in all these other parts of the budget, he's really stepping up to the plate. And I think it's kind of a lie that if y'all vote for him next time, he may take on, on the Medicare Social Security thing the next time around. Ron Levin? Oh, sorry. Ron Levin? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this goes back to the budget again. What, what is Congress going to do about funding for the Great Lakes? They're very important. And <coughs> the Appropriations Committee entirely restored Donald Trump's cuts to the Great Lakes Initiative. And I signed a letter, which is one of the reasons he did it. Quite frankly, I was even a little bit surprised that they restored 100%. I was expecting to restore like 80% or 90% given that we're broke. But the Appropriations Committee, being the Appropriations Committee, restored it all. Um, Bruce Carr. Wait a minute. Um, I had a couple questions. The first one was, why did it take you so long to reach out to the constituents in an open town hall meeting? Um, okay, I had, not in Cedarburg, but I had town hall meetings last spring around the district. We did several of them. Um, August, there among them not in Washington, the job's three weeks in Washington and one week back, so we're doing more now in this time of year. I come home every weekend, every weekend I try to meet with as many different people as possible. I certainly spend time at the Ozaki County Fair, meeting people around here. I also show up at you know all the other festivals. And I think sometimes you get a more accurate gauge of people doing that, and I, I'll tell you, I, I think I can say with a fair amount of survey of the 435 congressmen, Nobody meets with more people than I do. But as far as stru uh, structured town halls, we try to come through every county once or twice a year. I, I hope we do more by the end of the year if we have time. And um, well, I'd encourage you to keep doing it. Your predecessor, uh, even when nobody else was coming out, was holding in district five or six where he is now. Uh, regular town halls, and I respected his um, courage uh, to get up in front of his constituents. The second question I, I, I will tell you this I think there are a lot of congressmen right now who never do this. A surprisingly high number. And they do what they call teletown halls. And maybe I'll do some of those as well. But I think people prefer this sort of thing because you can see me and it's less scripted. Yep, no, I agree. Uh, the second question that I have. Uh, and then I'll refer to others, was basically uh, what probability do you give for a uh, budget passing by October 1st and a death ceiling to pass? And where do you stand on both of those? Okay, first of all, with regard to the budget, what we call the budget in Washington is not what I would have called the budget before I got there. We do two things. We pass a bill that kind of provides a framework for what the spending will be, and the appropriation bills really lay out the money that's going to be spent. Okay? Um, I will be very surprised if we do not pass a budget bill by October 1st. I'll be a little surprised if we don't pass appropriation bills by then. Then it goes over to the Senate. Things are more difficult in the Senate because they require 60 votes, which means you have Paul Ryan or Paul Ryan's surrogate sitting there with Mitch McConnell and Mitch McConnell's surrogate and uh, Chuck Schumer and his surrogate working towards a budget. And um, even though I think this budget is too free spending, I'll bet you Chuck Schumer thinks we ought to spend more. And 
that's going to be a problem. And like any negotiation, it takes two people to be reasonable. If one person doesn't want to be reasonable or one people person wants to spend more, we're not going to get it done. I believe the House will get appropriations bills out by September 30th. I think it's going to be more tougher in the Senate. And as you know, recently we wind up not doing the appropriation bills in which we deal with this committee or that committee. They wind up doing an <coughs> omnibus bill at the end. I hope that doesn't happen, but this will be the third, uh, the third, if you call it, set of appropriation bills or omnibus bills I've dealt with. And the first two, uh, they wound up not doing the appropriation bills according to Hoyle. They just did an omnibus bill at the end. And as I understand it, this has been going on for a long time since I got there. And uh, I think the reason is, is when you have one side that wants to spend more and one side does not want to spend a lot more right away, you've got a little bit of a deadlock. And in omnibus bills, you can put in policy to kind of buy votes or get your way to the magic 218 that you need in the House. Um, it's frustrating that it's not done that way. I'm used to being in the Wisconsin State Senate where you have a majority you run the show. But when you have to get 60 votes like they do in the U.S. Senate, it makes it a lot more complicated. And being in my third year, it's still kind of new to me. Um, I guess if I had to gamble, I don't know if they bet on this in Las Vegas, but if I had to bet, I'd bet on another omnibus bill, and I hate to say that. What about the debt ceiling? What about the debt ceiling? Oh, they're going to have to do it. So I'm, I, I'm not sure when our drop that date is because our drop that date changes over time depending upon what the estimates are and how in debt we are. I, I, we will get the debt ceiling done because it would be it would really rock financial markets if it's not done. So we'll get the debt ceiling done. I am disappointed right now. Because they have no problem with raising the debt ceiling as long as Congress shows it wants to make progress on the debt. And it's frustrating to vote to raise the debt ceiling if they're not making progress on the debt. Gavin Gaydon. Good grief, where are all these people? <laughs> Mary Macker. Not sure. Not sure. Sorry. I, I remember. But, you know, as a, as a business person, I, I looked kind of aghast at the way that the health care, I know it needs reform, and it does. But I looked at the way it seemed to be rushed through without due diligence, and, I, and it left me, you know, more than concerned. I, I don't know why one thinks one can control insurance. Costs. If one doesn't control health care costs, you can't do one without the other. And there's no other industry I know of where you don't base your charges on the cost to provide service. But we have an industry that doesn't always know the cost to provide a service. Uh, I'll agree with you entirely. Um, first of all, as far as we'd not, love to help yeah. you and I, be a part of this discussion. I agree with you. Um, I think on this and many other things, Congress does not even get enough information before we vote. Um, I think compared to state legislators, in Madison there are a variety of groups, the Fiscal Bureau, the Legislative Council, who provide reams of paper to state legislators before we vote. The U.S. Congress does not get enough information before I agree with you. It's a system I inherited. It's a system I complain about, but that is the reality. I also agree with you, be it the House or the Senate, they should spend more time focusing on cost. Because we got the cost of medical care in this country down by 20 or 25 or even 15 percent, all sorts of problems would disappear, right? More businesses would be able to provide insurance for their employees, more people would go to their insurance agent, would their individual plan for their individual plan. The government would be going broke on Medicare and Medicaid. You're absolutely right. They ought to focus more on cost. And when it comes, for example, to a medical procedure that the government is not involved in, 
because it's not part of Medicaid or Medicare, like cosmetic surgery, over time the number of providers goes up and the cost goes down, just like everything else in our society that the government's not involved in, right? Over time, um, you know, I don't know that right. I agree with that. Yeah, really because, well, <coughs> well, right. we that. Well, I've had to have health care in other countries. I've been in other countries, and it's well, much cheaper for things you need. I'm talking EKG well, and blood tests, yeah. sixty-seven euros, as compared to what would that cost here? Hundreds of dollars? Well, over a thousand. Yeah, that's exactly yes. the point I'm trying to make to you. But I'm government is involved in these other countries, and well, the other I'm, thing we don't do is look at best practices, which in business we look at best practices. What's working? And let's then try and adapt what's working in those places yes. for us. Some indivi individual hospitals and individual medical networks are working on best practices and they will tell you good things they are doing. Um, I do believe that if people have more buy-in on their own insurance, their own medical care, ultimately the cost can drop. There are Right now, there is not a lot of information out there for the average person on where to go or which hospital does this the best. But individual companies, if they work hard, <coughs> can find this information. And when they find the information, they are able to get their own health care costs to fall. I don't know how large of a business that you own, but for companies that have, say, over 400 employees, they are doing a better and better job over time controlling their own costs because they can see what the best practices are. They can see um, the, the cost of individual procedures, the hip replacement or whatever, can vary dramatically. And individual businesses find this out and they incentivize their employees to go to the more reasonable, uh, uh, more reasonable price provider. And you can begin to get a whole lot of costs. And this is something that we have to do across the board. And I do agree with you that both the Senate and House plan focused more on who was going to pay and how much they were going to pay for their insurance <coughs> rather than trying to hold down the overall medical costs. Well, I, I think you misunderstood me in that I think the government needs to look at how other governments are doing that and what is working. Because they do work in some places. And I'm not saying universal health care because it's all very different depending on what country. But there are things that work well. And I mean, I'd love to help you put stuff like that together. A lot of us would. But we're not allowed to be involved. I feel like Congress and, and everyone does everything for us. We want to start doing things for ourselves. And That's exactly right. That's exactly Greg Lee. Um, we talked about ACA right. and the disappointment. And uh, as a gentleman back here said, it's so tired of tax reform. What do you, what's your prediction on what really is going to happen in tax reform? It's probably next up, but is it going to be a sham? I don't think it's going to be a sham. Um, I think you know, it might not be as broad as some people originally wanted. There is no way they're going to get out of there without cutting the top cover because our top corporate rate is uncompetitive with the rest of the industrialized world and while the economy is not doing bad now, there's no way it doesn't improve if you cut the top corporate rate. Um, to a certain extent you can do that by getting rid of some individual tax credits that you could describe more as special <coughs> interest credits or reductions. Um, I also think right now we have something called the repatriation tax. If you are a multinational corporation or a multinational corporation based in the United States and you earn money in a low tax country, right now if you take that money that you earn there and pay tax in Ireland or Poland or Puerto Rico is even apparently considered a foreign nation for this purpose, and bring it back to the United States, you are taxed as opposed to keeping the money in Ireland or Poland or Puerto Rico. I think that repatriation repatriation tax will drop, and I think we need to get more money by dropping that tax, because right now they're not getting anything at all with the money sitting abroad. So I think those two things are going to get done. I think the public wants some form of tax simplification, 
and I'm going to get some kind of tax communication, but not as big as some people want. I think right now, some of the proposals lack common sense. And I'll give you an example of at least the way the House Ways and Means proposal was initially described. They want, let's say you've got rental property, which many people out there are rental property. They want to say that if I buy rental property, it's 100% expense in the first year. So in other words, if I buy a $300,000 for a family in Cedarburg, I don't know if that's what they go for, um, I get a $300,000 deduction in the first year, unlike depreciation, which on the face of it is kind of odd. Then they would say, we're not going to let you deduct mortgage interest deduction, which is kind of odd because that's an expense. They're going to say, we're not going to let you deduct the property tax. Okay, so you're going to wind up in a situation in which you're paying taxes and which you may even have a negative cash flow. This is the kind of lack of common sense thinking that's going on up there. So I think a goal that I have is to the degree possible, taxable income ought to mirror real income. I think the tax cut ought to be targeted at the middle class. I don't like greatly increasing the zero bracket amount because I think it's good if everybody pays something. Right? Everybody in our society benefits from the national defense. Everybody benefits from our national parks. So it's good if you had a, a, a low rate and have more people kicking something on the low end and not have special rates at the high end for people who are living off investments, which is what they're talking about right now. Um, I do think they'll get something done because the reason they didn't get something done in Obamacare so far is you're going to get somebody mad. And politicians might get something in demand. No matter what you do on Obamacare replacement, somebody, people in this room, are going to get mad. On tax cuts, traditionally, you just make people happy. So because you should be making people happy, it should get done. I've told you my concerns with the House plan, and I like the fact that Donald Trump, while he hasn't come up with his second plan, at least publicly said, we've got to do more for Genevieve Stent. Mostly, uh, this is a good follow-up to a question about healthcare. You keep mentioning that you believe in the free market for healthcare. Um, how do you intend to keep access, especially in rural Wisconsin, affordable and high quality? Most clinics can't operate without subsidies, let alone attract enough providers to really let someone shop around. It's not necessarily an issue close to the city, but. You're only going to have one doctor doing the placement well, in stable time. I'm going to comment because there's always this little bit of hostility towards the free market. Everything else in society, everything else that we spend money on, all homes, is free market. Right? We have a free market in cars, you have a free market in restaurants, we have a free market in food. And over time, not always, but I think you can say that the quality of all of that stuff improves over time. So when people are hostile to the idea of a free market in health care, um, it's almost like they're hostile to the American system. I mentioned before, um, I mentioned before cosmetic surgery, and, and the question in the back didn't take it right. But the fact is, cosmetic surgery is something the government doesn't get involved in at all, or other places. And it's something that over time, I am told, the cost falls. Okay? And just subjectively, I'm not sure the number of providers go up. So one would think if you do the same thing with other more necessary things, since they are both medical in nature and technology driven, you would also get more selection and more <coughs> providers. Now, we are not going to get rid of badger care state. It provides for many, many people. We are not going to get rid of Medicare, which deals with <coughs> many, many people. There are subsidies, you are right, right now for some rural hospitals that I think are not going to go away. But the long-term answer is we have to get medical care to cost less. And I think a little bit of that is the government shelters the providers from what every other business has to go through, which is to provide better for less. And right now our providers are to a large degree sheltered from that. 
and that is what causes everything else in our society to work. I think it is odd when you are dealing with something as so important as healthcare, all of a sudden you say, the free market won't work here. Well, to the degree possible, and we know we aren't going to let people die in the streets, but to the degree possible, you've got to let the free market work. Well, you said you aren't going to let people die in the street, but people don't choose to enter the healthcare market. They get That's sick, right. and then they need care, and they don't have, especially in rural Wisconsin, they don't have choice in providers. So this isn't the same as buying a car, because I choose to buy a car. I don't choose to need medical care, especially when there's an emergency. I don't know how I'm going to make free market decisions when I'm unconscious in the back of an ambulance. But there are a lot of decisions you do have a chance of. There are a lot of decisions your doctor tells you you need to go to Okay, and those are the type of decisions where the, the, the comprise a great deal of the health care cost in this country, and those are the type of decisions in which you will have choices to make, and we want to make sure those choices improve the quality of health care, and also make it more affordable, okay? Because as health care becomes more affordable, it becomes more accessible to people. Not that right now anybody can't show up in an emergency room and they have to take them. They do take them, but it would be nice if as many people as possible could get health care the way it was designed to be, which is I'll call the doctor, I'll make an appointment. I would just say to free market leads to competition. In cities, not in rural Wisconsin. They can't provide it. But you will know what no. you get there. Yeah. No. But at no. LER? L-E-R? No, I think that's Lee. Lee, Lee I think. Oh, Lee. Lee. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> now that it's 5 o'clock and you're almost ready to escape. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will finish this up as being the independent voter here. I did not vote for you. I did not vote for Donald Trump. I am here to hear what you had to say about things. And I'm pleasantly surprised because I do agree with a lot of what you're saying. My main question is when are you all in Washington going to get together and get something done for the rest of us? Uh, uh. As I said, I think by historic standards, if you measure success by the number of bills, I don't, but my leadership tells me to measure by the number of bills passed. We are getting more done by volume of bills than they did in the beginning of other administrations. There are a few high profile things that we have not gotten done. And I said, I believe that there will be some sort of tax reform passed this year. The public demands it and it makes people happy to pay less taxes so it should get done. There will be a budget passed because we usually don't like to shut down the government for months and months. Maybe we shut down by a couple of weeks. That's been happening before many, many times. But I assume we will pass a budget. I think welfare reform is very important and nobody could argue that it is not broken. I, my optimism or pessimism goes up and down by the week as I talk to different senators and I talk to Paul Ryan and depending upon what he tells me. Um, I think those are the big issues. We are doing a lot of, as you call, VA reform or human trafficking bills, minor, I don't know. We do get stuff like that done and um, hopefully we'll get some of the other reasons why I ran for this office, hopefully get those things done as well. So I'll, I'll be doing all I can when I fly out a week from tomorrow. And I work as hard as I can up there and as forceful as I can do without being a Here. Well, if you have a couple of more, it's like we're really <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie Larson. Thank you. Um, I'm Lizzie Larson. I'm the Republican Party Chair. Um, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got to be true. 
um, that this is kind of an historical long period before, between major, major storms that hit the United States. So insofar as climate change is affecting hurricanes, it would indicate that things are getting better. I mean, we're always going to have some hurricanes. This was kind of a big gap between major hurricanes by historical um, and otherwise, I think historically, it's been kind of silly to say we can legislate the weather. We're always going to have some tornadoes. We're going to have some hurricanes. And as I mentioned before, you're, you're younger, but when I was a child, they made a big deal about global cooling. And nobody had anything about it. Global cooling stopped. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I remember reading Newsweek magazine, you know, like, you know, we weren't going to be able to grow any wheat in Canada anymore, and everybody was going to sort of make you this stuff. So, I have not at this time an alarmist on the weather. Do you believe it? Thank you. Next question. Russell Mant. <coughs> um, why don't you take back to the, to the Republican caucus that I have a, um, discussed with them that borders on low them. For years and years and years, you have told us to give us the House, give us the Senate, give us the presidency. We've had 60 stupid votes on replacing Obamacare. Yeah. And you must think that we're all stupid out here to think, look at their voting on replacing Obamacare. They're doing a good job. When it comes down to it, you can't do it. We're sitting here watching a farce in Washington, D.C., where we now have a constitution that guarantees that people won't be offended, and we spend more time trying to decide what statues to have up than anything else. Yeah. Um, this, well, the, the, truly, the level of disgust I have is palpable with the work that's not being done. Well, I'm there, and i got to wash it up close. <laughs> so it frustrates me more than you, because I deal with it every day. And, and I can tell you, I give them the speech as much as I can without being typed to them. That, and I'll give them the speech on this budget, because I think at a minimum, if you vote a Republican in November, you expected a little more fiscal responsibility. And you're not getting it, and it drives me up the wall. Uh, as far as Obamacare and the Republicans collectively, you've got to remember our bosses are the voters, not Republican leadership. So I have a feeling if you talk to Mitch McConnell, which I haven't, I think he'd say, look, I'm not a voter in Arizona. The voters in Arizona gave us John McCain. The voters in Alaska gave us Lisa Murkowski. And these are the people I have to do. Why is it in, in Obamacare we hear about the 11 million or the 22 million people that will be losing their insurance when the gist of the bill is going to affect the other 350 million people negatively in the United States? Why, are, why aren't we paying attention to the 350 million and then later on trying to figure out what to do with the 11 million? Well, I can tell you I voted for two bills. Okay, and after great wailing and gnashing of teeth, they got whatever, 217 or 218 Republicans or whatever they needed to, have, to vote for a bill out of the House. And they got 49 bills to vote for something else. the um, I... And even more frustrated on the budget than that, because I think the appropriate course of action is even more obvious. Health care is a tough issue. Uh, I hope that my colleagues spent August meeting with people, average people, and not just at fundraisers or junkets abroad, or hanging around watching television, whatever they do, so that they know how frustrated people are. And I can tell you, well, you are frustrated at home watching TV, me being there and having to, I can understand what happened on the bottom here, but on the budget, the lack of urgency on welfare, the lack of urgency on immigration, it drives me up the wall. And as I said, I think talking to somebody before, to me, if you're in Congress and you were there for 40 years, you want to be there in 2017. Because this is the time things are supposed to be. And too many of our colleagues are acting like it's 1977 they have 30 years to write the ship. We don't have 30 years to write the ship. And I don't know why they don't see it. I don't know if they've been there too long. I don't know about people. But I can tell you I'm very low. 
on some of these things, the way the rules work, you weren't going to get tax reform as a practical matter until now anyway. You weren't going to get welfare reform until now anyway. The budget and appropriation bills were not going to pass until now anyway. So on those items, you really, having been there, the way Congress works, it wasn't going to happen before September 30th at the earliest day. Uh, on Obamacare, it's just very, uh, on, on Obamacare, it's a very difficult issue because you're going to get somebody mad. And politicians don't like people, any more than anybody else in life, like to get people mad. Um, like I said, we got something out of the house. Uh, next time I see Lisa Murkowski, I'll talk to her and I'll try to report back. If I do another one of those, I'll tell you what's going on here in that. What are you going to do with Mitch McConnell? <laughs> <laughs> he is, 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 is not boss. Right? Paul Ryan can ask me to do things that you guys are my boss. And therefore, it's not exactly like a business where you say, how come the boss isn't telling this person to do that? The people of Alaska are like the Lisa Murkowski. What are they going to do? I mean, Mitch McConnell, he's got her, he's got to deal with her, but he can't fire her. She's the senator from Alaska. Senator isn't he twisting arms and making threats to people and um, I, I will also, be, we're going to break up, and I don't mean to answer a question that we were just talking about, but I will tell you one other thing. Because it was something, I hope you show up here to get something interesting, different than you get from the journal sets. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to talk to you before, I didn't want to make sure I talked to you. Uh, one of the problems we have right now, at least in the House of Representatives, is compared to a state legislature, the boss, which is Paul Ryan, the speaker, seems to have, and the press hasn't picked this up, so I'm telling you a secret thing here that you can take off. Compared to the speaker of the house in Madison, a guy by the name of Robin Boss, compared to the Senate majority, the other guy by the name of Scott Fitzgerald, Paul Ryan does not have a lot of power to reward somebody or a lot of power to punish them. And that's a problem. There were shifts made up there within the last two years to mm. take power away from the leader. Mm. And everybody in the legislative process doesn't like that the leader has more power than they do. You know, when I was in the state assembly, I don't know if you recognize these names, I might not have liked it, but a Scott Jensen or a John Gard was much more powerful than Glenn Gould. But when you have a powerful leader, they can get things done. And right now, a lot of people in Congress complain that then John Boehner had too much power. And we want to make sure our new leader doesn't have as much power. So they took power away from Paul Ryan, and Paul Ryan willingly, in my, in my opinion, mistakenly, gave up that power. He mm. said, okay, mm. I don't mind if the speaker's less powerful. So he gave up power. And I think we're paying a price now for having those congressmen get their way and saying, we don't want the leader to be that powerful. And that's a, an important thing, and it's kind of an inside baseball thing, but it's an important, people, important thing that you don't be able to do. Now, thank you for all being here. Thank you.